Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you are watching my 100% walkthrough for The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword for Nintendo Wii. In the last video, we explored the first half of the Linnaeus Sand Sea, and now we're finally ready to continue our journey in search of the mysterious sand ship. Alright, so now we finally have access to the left side of the map now that we have the sea chart, and it, it just feels a little bit arbitrary because we can totally see everything, and if you had tried to go this way before, then uh, Skipper would have just yelled at you and said that we didn't actually know which way to go, and he'd make you turn back. Um, it's all kind of arbitrary, but again, in real life, the reason you need a sea chart is because there's totally things under the water that you can't see, and so we're using various instruments to figure out your GPS location, etc. You can coordinate that and figure out where you are in relation to your sea chart so that you can avoid things under the water so you don't die. Um, anyways, up ahead there is a bunch of new enemies. This one is actually a, I suppose it's a water spume. They don't, you can't z-target these guys, so we don't actually know their name for sure. So they could be like an aqua spume or something, or a water spume, aqua spume. Um, I don't know, I'll call them one of those. <laughs> uh, I guess there's no real way to know for sure though. We also have explosive barrels that you want to avoid, and it's kind of, if you're just going full blast straight ahead, then you might find a hard time seeing them. But all you have to do is actually just follow the far southern wall or whatever, and that'd be fine too. There's also a bunch of Bokoblin archers. These particular ones actually shoot out flaming arrows, and if they, I think if you get close even, they'll shoot the explosive barrels too. They don't only shoot at you, I'm pretty sure. Anyways, just avoid them all. You can just run past them, all the enemies. You don't have to worry about them at all, and go to the far left until you finally reach the shipyard. Alright, our next objective is to enter the nearby building, but of course the door is closed, so the only way in is to take the longest path possible. <laughs> like literally circle around the rest of the entire area until we finally have explored every square inch of this before we finally reach that building. It's totally logical. Now you want to go ahead and speak with the bird statue to activate it. You don't necessarily have to save per se, but just make sure you talk to it at least so that we have it activated so we can warp back here whenever we want. I think here I was trying to uh, dash repeatedly and I kept accidentally talking to the statue. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and continue off to the right where there is a couple of Zalfos. Now you can defeat them if you want to, it doesn't really matter too much though. Uh, I think the best way to deal with them honestly is to use some shield attacks or whatever to uh, counterattack them. But otherwise, as soon as you can get them on the ground, you can uh, fish, uh, fatal blow. Almost fin finishing blow. Blech. Fatal blow them. Blech. Of course, we really want to get old school on the names. We could call it like downward strike. You could downward strike these enemies if you want, guys. <laughs> It all means the same thing. Now, you don't actually have to fight these Lizalfos because all we have to do is enter the next building. Uh, I kind of like to defeat them just because they give us the Lizalfos tails. Uh, but as soon as you enter this next building, they'll actually leave you alone. So they chase you up these, these stairs right here. But as soon as you enter this building, they'll go away. So here we have a Goron who's just hanging out next to some Lizalfos, as you do. And his name is Gortrim. And he is apparently hanging out with minecarts for some reason. But um, anyways, he's here to just give you random safety information, um, which is kind of weird, <laughs> I guess. He's just telling you how to use it real quick. There is actually some notes on the walls, I believe, too, that give, tell you all that stuff, too. They just have a character here to draw attention to it. But he does offer a later minigame once we come back here, so I will show how to do that once the time comes. I'm going to go ahead and hop in the minecart, and then at this point, what you can do is you can lean with the Wiimote just by tilting it back and forth. This part's pretty easy, but basically, as long as you lean, like, away from a turn, then that way, or like, or you lean towards the direction you're turning to, then that way you don't fall over, and that's the only thing you have to watch out for. This first track's pretty easy, there's not really much to say about it, you just kind of tilt back and forth. Um, later we have a little bit harder ones, and I'll explain once we get to that point. So once you climb out of the minecart, there is some Linnaeus dragonflies up ahead, so go ahead and grab those if you want, and then continue onwards. In this next little building, there is a bunch of Araka, and you can't actually just totally ignore them. You don't have to fight them at all. But continuing onward, there, straight ahead there is a uh, zip line. This particular one leads all the way back to the beginning. You don't want to do that, because we're trying to progress onward. To do so, you want to continue on ahead and then go to the right.
In this room, we see an unpowered robot, and that's not really too exciting, but there is a sign on the wall that says that this minecart leads to the construction bay. Oh yeah, now we're talking. This second minecart is a little bit more difficult, so now we actually have points where the tracks actually fork. So in order to choose which path you want to take, you just lean in the direction you want to go. It's pretty obvious there's like signs, whatever, that are blocking off the exits or whatever. So if you go through them, then you'll crash and have to start over again. Um, so it's pretty obvious what you have to do. So right here, there's a fork where you need to go off to the right, for example. The next thing to know is we do have some various jumps, and those are a little bit odd. You can't technically jump the jumps. Um, and how you do that is you actually lift the entire controller up. Like, don't swing it. Rather, you lift the entire controller, like you make your whole hand go up. And so if you do that super early, you can jump over these gaps. But more important to know about the jumps is if your controller is tilting forward or tilting back, you will actually tilt in midair. Like, whatever, whatever direction you're tilting while you're in midair, then the minecart will do that. Now, if you hold the controller just kind of flat, then it doesn't do anything and you're fine. So the safest thing to do is just don't do anything. The problem with that is you lose a little bit of speed, which doesn't really matter right now, but later we have a mini game we can do using minecarts and uh, being able to jump the jumps is helpful, but I'll explain more about that once we get to it. There's a couple turns that are pretty tight. In particular, there was one that like, we just passed a little bit ago where you had to actually choose the fork in the road first, and uh, you just have to be careful to hold one direction, basically. Um, after you've watched this a couple times, you'll kind of get a feel for it. But here we have those jumps. You want to hold your controller really, really flush. I think what happened here is my controller uncalibrated is what happened while I was in the middle of doing this, so it got literally wonky. You can see when I'm attacking these barrels, how it's all off to the right. So anyways, I'm going to fix that here in a little bit. You can save at the bird statue if you want, because we do have a little mini boss upcoming and then you can sit on these stools to regenerate your health if you want. But just make sure your controller is really calibrated for this next boss because it will help a lot to have that fixed. So before we truly begin, I do recommend you attack the nearby Arrakis so we don't have to deal with them for the middle of this battle. Uh, but all you have to do is pull out that uh, gust bellows and blow on the sand here in that mound in the middle to reveal the mini-boss. as it starts getting uncovered. Gee, I have no idea what this is. So you could focus on either one of the pinchers you want. So this Moldorak fight is the same as last time, and you can just know that the pinchers attack at different rates. So they turn red right before they attack, the little one attacks fast, and the bigger one has more of a delay between its attacks. So if you are going to try shield bashing it, just be aware of that. So here I was trying to shield bash um, in a little bit, but I didn't time it well. Now another trick for fighting this guy is actually to or her, this chick, you can use the slingshot to stun the eyes inside the pinchers as well, and it stuns it for quite a while, so you could stun it, attack, stun it, attack, stun it, attack, and that works really well. Otherwise, generally speaking, shield bashes will allow you to get at least two good hits in, so if you a well-timed uh, shield bash will work very well. Now, as I keep explaining, well-timed shield bashes are awesome. So right here, you'll see I, I shield bash way early, but it still counted. And uh, But yeah, single shield bashes are amazing. If you just keep spamming it, bash, 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 it just does not work very well. Whenever the boss does this little charging move, you want to make sure you back up. And the best way to do that is to like uh, stop Z-targeting it and then hold A and run backwards. Right here, just let go of Z, and I didn't do it in time there. I think I do it pretty good for the rest of the battle, but otherwise, whenever it starts using its tail attack, then it'll, its eyes will turn red. Quickly run forward, because it's not going to move for a second, you have a great opportunity to smack it in the eye. So for the second phase, all you're trying to do is keep smacking it in the eye over and over again, but every time it sticks its brow ridge down like that to charge at you, then just stop the targeting and start running in the opposite direction. You can dodge off to the side too, I find that doesn't really work half the time, so I think just dodging back with stamina is the best way to do that. So unfortunately here, my controller got uncalibrated, which is really awkward for this boss. You can only kill it with stabs, so I have to have my sword working properly. You can't really tell when my shield is out, but when it's not out, you can see my sword's being all weird. So anyways, I'm gonna fix that real quick, and then I'll go and fight the boss once more. And I know I keep saying this, but I'm really surprised at this. Like, I've never had issues like this before, and I've always felt the controls for Skyward Sword were amazing. I just thought they'd work really, really well, and people would be like, oh, the controls are crap, and like, I never understood what they meant. Is this what people mean when they say that? It's just that it's uncalibrating all the time, because if you can't rely on it, then it doesn't work? Um, I always thought it was an issue of just them not knowing where to position it or something, but 
It's uh, it's pretty unreliable in the sense that I it doesn't do what I expect it to because it keeps changing all the time. I've kind of found workarounds for it and everything, so it's it's fine, but yeah, it's just aggravating. Anyways, once you've defeated Moldarak, then Phi will be like, oh yeah, I guess we didn't actually have to come in here at all, so <laughs> this whole trip was for nothing. Sorry, Link, our princess was in another castle. Boats can be princesses too, you know, they often, vessels usually have female pronouns, it seems, so, you know, it works out. That's all we can do here for now, so go ahead and leave. Make sure that you speak with the bird statue if you haven't yet, just to activate that so we can warp back here whenever we want, because we will be coming back here later for a later mini game to get a piece of heart. So go ahead and return back to Skipper and set sail again. And he comments that apparently if the boat is not here either, then his ship has probably got taken over by the pirates, which is what he feared. So our next objective is to head to the pirate stronghold, which is to the far north. Our destination is just to the north, it's very visible, in fact it's just all these pillars kind of in the background, and along the way there is a bunch of enemies including a bunch of explosive barrels. That's kind of the only obstacle we really need to watch out for, but otherwise you can basically just follow the left wall and just keep going north. So as always, whenever you get to a bird statue, you do want to at least interact with it so you can warp here later, but I would recommend you save here in case you die inside due to the enemies. Um, not that they're that hard, but just in case so that if you do have to load from your saved location or whatever, that you, at least you'll pop up here. Uh, but this is good to have this, this location to warp to with your bird because there is a goddess cube here later. So if you want to be able to get to that easily, then I would recommend that you have this bird statue unlocked. Now before we continue onwards, you'll notice that the... Uh, pirate stronghold itself is actually like in the shape of a shark head and inside the nose of the shark head There's actually three silver rupees um, Which amounts to 300 rupees which is awesome. There's a bunch of uh, thunder keys here And one trick that I like to use is to actually just use the whip to fight them as well You just kind of flick the Wiimote back and forth with it and it works pretty good um, But what's cool about that though is that it doesn't matter if they're electric or not You can still smack them with that and it defeats them very easily I've heard people say that there's a red rupee on top of one of the pillars here, and I, you know, I practiced this game twice before I recorded it, and each time I did not see, I looked for it with the beetle and I couldn't figure out where it was. I just thought it was on top of one of these pillars, these little holes with the heads on them, uh, but I didn't see it anywhere. So if somebody could let me know in the comments if that's true then, and where it is, that'd be cool just to share with everybody. So I didn't show it in this recording because I didn't know where it was. When you're done messing around out here, the entrance to the pirate stronghold is actually on the side in this little doorway off to the right side, so go over there. I think there's actually a yellow choo-choo just outside the doorway too, so just be careful for that too. All right, so the Pirate Stronghold, just like the Lonely Remining Facility, uses a lot of time shift stones to move things back to the past, and so this will allow us to access different areas. So just keep an eye out for different things that you can interact with in the rooms because you're going to have to keep switching things back and forth between the past and the present. In this next room, we have two Lizalfos at once. You don't actually have to face these guys at all. You can totally just run past them because they don't go past the doorway, actually. So these are actually just here kind of as a distraction. So you can defeat them if you want to. It doesn't really matter. In particular, it's useful to defeat them if you want to get the, uh, the Lizalfos tails. Now, in general, though, too, I do like to defeat all the enemies just because it's part of the whole reason why I'm playing this game. It's just the experience. Like, I just think Lizalfos are interesting, so I enjoy it. <laughs> 
This room's sort of cool because there's these little like um, nubs off to the side that you can jump on to save stamina. So you can actually just jump back and forth even with, you, can't, you don't jump off them normally, but you can use Z and A to force yourself to jump. What I was trying to show here is you can jump across each one of these to get across the sand. You don't even like barely touch the sand if you go along the right side in particular. Uh, but apparently I was too close to the electro stream. I didn't realize that if you touch them, actually they electrocute you when they're getting all zappy, when they're charging up their attack. I guess it's kind of similar to like Thunder Keys, how they get all electrified too right before they attack. Anyways, that's just unusual, but I do think it's interesting. I didn't realize that they could electrocute you just by touching them. Um, but I guess if you're, honestly, if you're getting electrocuted by Electrospume just by touching them, then you're way too close. So in this next room, we now finally have access to Time Shift Orbs. Now these guys are, unlike Time Shift Stones, which can be, which can be activated or deactivated, Time Shift Orbs will actually keep their time shift active all the time, but the difference is you can pick them up and move them around. So this gives us a lot of very interesting puzzles where things will constantly move back and forth between the past and the present, depending on where you're currently standing. But you can also set it down and leave it places to leave a certain area of the room in the past so you can interact with it in different ways. I think these things are super cool, although I, what I think would, might be kind of a little bit more interesting though is if we were able to actually use the claw shots on it to suck it up and bring it over to us. Because then we could have puzzles where maybe we needed it to be on one side of the room, but then we could like suck it up and pull it over to us from the other side. Which I just think that would be kind of interesting if they let us do things like that. Up ahead we have some techno blends, and unfortunately if you knock them out of the area they will return to being skeletons. Um, the reason this is a problem is because you pretty much have to kill all the ones in this particular room. And you can actually throw time shift orbs or roll them just like you do with bombs, so that's kind of interesting. Now, as always though, if you're going to do something like that, your controller does need to be calibrated properly in order to throw them or roll them the way you want to. I showed this a lot in the Linear Mining Facility, but if you encounter a Beemos, you can totally deal with them pretty easily by just simply using a Shield Bash. So here what I'm doing is I'm waiting for it to stop attacking so that I can run forward and attack it. You can wait for it to be turned around, but otherwise just Shield Bashing the Beam right back at it is the best way to take care of them. This does of course only work if you have the Wooden Shield or Divine Shield, or you know, Sacred Divine Goddess Shield. Up ahead we have these electrified walls here that we can only get through when it's in the present. So set the orb down a little bit further back so you can access this chest, which contains a silver ruby, which is worth 100. Now before we continue too much further, there is this area where we have to jump around on these platforms. However, down in the lower portions of this room, there's usually a bunch of ancient flowers. There's usually at least one, but typically there's more like three. So here I'm just grabbing a bunch of them before we continue. I like to point out whenever there's nice places for treasure like this because it, like if you're getting the ones that are convenient or like there's a bunch of them very easy to get then that means you don't have to go hunting for them at other points in the game you know what i mean like rather than stressing about it or like having to go out of your way to go get them if you just get these convenient ones like this like rather than like oh there's one here there's one there instead you're like hey i got three all at once it's just awesome so it just makes things a lot easier. So these puzzles, how it works, you have to go up the other ramp and then jump across these platforms, which apparently come in sets of two. Um, I do find this a little bit easier to go ahead and use Z-targeting in particular, so just take it slow and just aim. There's usually you can just kind of aim at 90 degree angles and you can get it pretty good. In the next room, there's another one of those electric barriers. You want to go ahead and set the orb down past it a little bit so you can still walk through here and then go around the other side and go ahead and pull the lever. Now you can do this by either running up the wall or you can also use the whip to grab this as well. This will lower the nearby metal grating which allows us to take the orb through. In this next room we have a bunch more of those platform walls. I don't even know what you'd call these things. Um, but anyways, there's a bunch of these things in the way and they, as well as Deku Babas. Now they're scattered throughout the room, but in the top right corner there is a chest containing treasure. So you can back up a little bit. I should have just backed up a little bit further here, but I just was lazy. I figured whatever, it's close enough. Um, so as long as the platform on the right side isn't active, but I should have just backed up that orb a little bit more so that I could have gone more of a direct route instead of running all the way around it like that. So as you've noticed though, this room is filled with sand, so we have to just travel with the time shift orb because that gives us solid ground that we can stand on so we can regenerate our stamina that way. So here I was just showing how I should have just backed up just a little bit so this wall was down too and I could have just dashed across. Um, but yeah, you position the, the orb right and you can dash to that pretty easily. Up ahead we have two Deku Babas and a single Quadra Baba. Now there's a couple different ways you can deal with these guys. Uh, spin attacks are like okay, especially if they're all horizontal, but honestly, the easiest way to take care of them is to just roll a bomb. Because what'll happen is you can get them to all munch on it and it should defeat all of them at once, which is great. Otherwise, the next safest ways to deal with them is probably to either use Skyward Strikes or the Beetle, actually, which just seems like a weird thing, but you can totally smash their stems when they're uh, vertical, like upright as well. Like most people always think of it in terms of getting rid of them when they're um, hanging from the ceiling, but you can totally get them from other times as well, or from other positions. 
This hallway has two Deku Babas. There's actually a trick to uh, running past Deku Babas where uh, when they first are like showing themselves, they pop out of the ground and they're like shaking their head at you for a split second. When they first do that, they'll attack instantly. But after that, there's like a pause in between when they're attacked next. So actually, if you like time it well, you can totally um, like run forward, wait for them to shake their head, then run past them real quick, and you can get through without having to fight them at all. So there's actually a trick there if you time it well where you can run through that hallway without actually fighting the Deku Babas whatsoever. In this next room, we have a little interesting puzzle. We have this small room off to the left that is that has a switch in it. What the switch will do is it swaps the two iron bars, so that makes this one closed and it makes the one in front of the next door open. Now, unfortunately, if you bring the time shift orb in here, it will make this other exit electrified, so you can't actually press through it when it's in the past like that. So our goal is to place the time shift orb outside of the room, just a little bit just past the other doorway so that we can still get through here. Um, and we don't bring that to the past so it's not electrified. I'm going to go ahead and pull the nearby block onto the switch, and this will swap the bars, but now you need to be able to exit the room. So, by not having the other exit um, in the past, this allows us to run through here next to this electrospume so we can get back on solid ground. So you have to pre-place the time shift orb in a great place so that you can still get to solid ground from here. In this next room, we have two doorways. Remember that these little spiky things will remove, get, go away in the past, but then these electric doors will appear in the past instead. So our goal is, if I place this time shift orb right here, I can get through both of these two doorways real quick. Now, you don't have to defeat these Beemos, but I do think it's significantly easier. So what I'm doing is I'm just smacking both of these guys. Um, so I'm killing the one first, and now I'm gonna bring the time shift orb over so I can fight the other one. You can fight them both at the same time, but it is a lot more awkward. And if you get in a tight situation, I always recommend just using shield bashes to deal with these guys. I never used shield bashes before, I always just like ran away and waited for them to turn around and then I'd run, run over and attack them real quick, but man, like now that I started, now that I've realized that shield bashes are a thing and it works really well, like, it is so powerful. If you place the time shift orb down where that first Beemos was, then this makes it so that we can actually still access the door on the right. Um, you don't have to place it right there, but it is nice. But on the other side of the wall, there is a lever. Now the lever is covered up with some spikes, so you can't actually reach it when it's in the present. So by having it in within the time shift orb's radius, this will allow us to pull the lever. Do so, this will make the nearby iron bars lower, so we can get the time shift orb over to this side of the room. Go ahead and grab the nearby treasure before you forget, and then we have two Beemos to deal with at the same time, or not Beemos, uh, Armos to deal with at the same time. Now, I like to just move the, the time shift orb a little bit to one side or the other so that I can just fight one of them at a time. You can totally fight both of them at the same time if you want to, I just think it's significantly harder. And as usual, because you are relying on stabs, I do think that having your controller calibrated makes a big difference for this, so I would recommend you recalibrate before you start fighting them. <laughs> So my trick for defeating these guys in one phase is basically to, uh, like here I'm starting to move off to the right immediately, and then I start, I slash the first object, and then I just dash off to the right using um, Z and A to like side hop. Um, so that's how I'm taking care of that. Now you could like stop targeting for a little bit and then run around them with dash with A, and then quickly start targeting them again, and then you could stab them, and that would be a way to do that. In the next room, place the time shift orb on top of the pedestal, and this will open up the rest of the pirate stronghold so that we can access some new areas outside, which is kind of interesting. This will also open up the nearby door so that we can get out. And one thing I always thought was kind of weird about this dungeon is just that, like, um, I don't understand... This, this technology is totally the same as the robots. So, are the pirates, were they originally robots? I know this area is all infested with Girahim's forces or whatever, but it's just kind of, or like, were they always the bad guys here? Were they always the pirates with all these Lizalfos and stuff? Like, honestly, so far, we haven't seen much of the robots in general. Like, they're, 
I mean, sure, they were mining in the, they were in the linear mine. There was a couple here and there in the linear mining facility, I think, even. Uh, but, like, honestly, like, we have a lot of robot technology, but we haven't seen a lot of robots, and I haven't seen much dwelling places for them or anything, so I don't really know, like... I guess it just seems like there's not enough population to support this many pirates, I guess is part of what I'm trying to say. I guess that's true with every Zelda game, though. You have, like, dungeons that are significantly more expansive than every single town. You know, the towns are, like, three buildings or whatever, and then they have this giant dungeon filled with enemies or whatever. So as you're trying to leave going across this bridge thing, then Fi will call out to you and say that these nearby masts that are in the sand are probably pieces of the ship that you're looking for. Now, I do find this kind of weird because, uh, you know, like the ship is, we're going to go to the ship and we actually can bring it to the past and we can see the sails and everything like that. So what are these pieces even mean? Is, these pieces are from the future or like the present anyways. But then when we take the ship to the past, then it, the sails are present. Like, I don't know, it's like you have the pieces are in two places at once, so to speak, or... I don't know, it's just weird. This is the only dowsing option that I think that is actually required in the entire game, because you have to use this basically to find the sand ship, but I think all the other dowsing ones pretty much are... You can just ignore them entirely if you know where to go. Before you leave Pirate Stronghold, you want to turn around, and now that we've opened up the shark mouth of the stronghold, you can see that there's actually a target above the door we just came out of. So claw shot to it, then claw shot around the other side, and this will lead to a goddess cube. Now, if you were paying attention during the cutscene when it showed the mouth opening just a little bit ago, you would have actually noticed this cube up here. If you've been following along with me, this should be your 21st cube so far, actually, and this particular one leads to a piece of heart. That's all we had to do here, so next return to Skipper's boat so that we can go find the sand ship. But it is kind of weird, like, we went through this whole dungeon and the thing we got for it was just the ability to douse. <laughs> which doesn't feel like all that exciting when you actually think about it. But I guess that's kind of more of a reward than we got from the last couple places, though. <laughs> the last one in particular was like, well, there's nothing here. Although the game does force you to go in this order, like, if you try to come to the pirate stronghold early, then Skipper won't let you. Both because, at first, because you don't have a sea chart, so he won't let you go west at all. And then the second time is he makes you go to the shipyard first. If you try to come to the pirate stronghold, even though you actually have access to it, he will yell at you and make you turn around. So now that we can douse for the sand ship, it's pretty easy to find. We just need to find it somewhere in the sand sea. However, its initial location is always the same. It'll kind of run away from us and it'll make these like figure eight patterns. Uh, but if you, but it always starts in the same location. And that is actually over here to the right. So it's over here, just north of Skipper's Retreat, kind of in this open sea area, like just right at the entrance of the Millennium River Sand Sea in the first place, actually. So we're going to head over there, you just follow this left wall basically for a while and you'll eventually get to it. So as Skipper explained, his ship is actually equipped with a cloaking device that will make it so that people can't find it. This is intentional to keep the bad guys away from Neighbor's Flame apparently, but now that it's working against us. But now that we can douse for it, we can figure out where it is. And all we have to do to break the cloaking field is actually just shoot the sand ship with the cannon. So how you do that is you switch back and forth by toggling it with the B button, just like you do with your B button items, and this will allow you to switch to your cannon. Now you can't actually fire your cannon and move your boat at the same time, so you're going to have to switch back and forth. So one quick tip for you as well is you can actually move the boat around while dowsing, so you can totally alternate between using the cannon and using C. Right now I'm not doing that just because I'm really far away, but... Anyways, you can totally move around and use A to sprint just like you normally would and just move around with the analog stick while using C. So you alternate between using C and using the, I think you gotta press B twice to switch to the cannon and then B and then C real quick to switch back to dowsing. But you can just toggle back and forth. You don't have to like, you know, you don't have to hold still while using C is I guess what I'm trying to say. Once you get close to the initial starting location of the sand ship, it'll finally start moving. Uh, but it actually always starts in the same place. So actually, if you know where the starting position is and you kind of memorize the, uh, the landmarks that are around, you can actually just shoot it from a distance and hit it that first time, and you'll always, you're always guaranteed to hit it. Now, your targeting reticule with your cannon itself will actually show you if you're close to your target, like it's, it like suddenly shortens, um, and this is a real firm, like, indication that you're close enough. So you could actually, rather than shooting bi blindly, you could wait until your targeting reticule looks like it's correct, or rather wait till it's correct and then aim a little bit more in the direction you think the boat's traveling. Once you kind of figure out which direction it's traveling to, you want to quickly shoot in that direction before you start um, moving your boat again, because you're likely to hit the sand ship a second time. So that's what I did here, is I saw it was moving to the right, so I shot a cannon blast over to the right as well, and that intercepted and it worked great. So once you've hit it three times, this will neutralize the cloaking field and allow us to enter the next dungeon of the game. So that's the end of this video, folks. Join me for the next one, where we will tackle the sand ship. This is the wrong train. Uh, we can fly. It'll be fine. I was gonna show how to get it across the river. The flame. I guess I can't do it now that it's raining. So you can shoot it up to this torch right here, but it's super hard. It's like so rough. Maybe maybe I should show this. Um let's let's go sleep in a house. Okay, when you say green quality, is that the ones that we've been using this whole time? 
I was like, oh man, he's like spending a whole bunch of gold on me every time. Um, but yeah, I am getting low on a lot of them. No. Stop. Wow. Wow, this did not work at all. Can I step this on top of something? And then do it? Set it at it even though it's... Yeah. Oh my goodness. I just want to sit. Dude, really? Oh my goodness. Wow. This is so hard. I can't... <laughs> I have to do it. You know what? There. <laughs> right. <laughs> it does... Sleeping does change it, doesn't it? Change the day. Just happened to be raining because Hatino hates me. Okay. What I was trying to show <laughs> is that you can get the flame across the river. Eh, eh, eh. So cool. Here we go. And set everything on fire. Just like real life. 